Hello, I am Keith Collard and welcome to the first ever video for Under Film Investigation. Uh, on this channel we're going to be going over uh, some short films, some sketches, and uh, some just VFX tests. But with all those you're going to get breakdowns and tutorials on exactly how those effects were created. Uh, so without further ado, let's get to today's. Uh, this is the force field effect. So with this VFX test, I uh, shot it, did the effect, uh, did the sound, and uploaded it to YouTube all in under five hours. Um, could I have gotten a better composition with a little more time? Yeah, probably. But that's not what we're going for here. We're going for speed. Now for this VFX test, I used Nuke entirely. Um, I know what you're thinking. Most people on the internet and all these tutorials are on After Effects. But yeah, that's exactly right. It's the internet. Um, I've been in the film industry for a little while now. And uh, I was there during the transition of when everyone in all the major studios switched over from After Effects to Nuke. So if you're looking for a job in this industry, you better get used to it. But Keith, who's going to help me learn how to use Nuke? Me. I am. So I'd like to start off by saying that this isn't going to be a tutorial on how to use Nuke itself, per se, as far as a program goes. It's more going to be a tutorial on how to do this particular effect and how I went about it. Um, so if I go through things through this tutorial a little too quickly, you can always comment below and ask me to go over something again and I can uh, let you know in a later video or I can just respond to you on there. If we look at this shot here, this is the end effect and the original footage looked like this. Um, so you can see there's a lot of work that was done on it. Uh, this is the footage coming straight out of my Canon 60D where I used a 50 millimeter lens uh, with a 1.4 f-stop. I went with that lens because of the uh, lower light that I could get with it. And since I was going to be shooting at night, uh, this was the way to go. So first off, what we want to do is denoise our footage a little bit or degrain it. Um, I find it's best to work on it this way. That way you can add the grain back on later which will go over the top of your shot and your effect and it will seam the two together a little better. So you can hit tab and grab a denoise and plug that at the bottom of the source and view that. I think I turned this down to about 0.8. I think it was denoising it a little too much. And you want to grab a position on the shot where the shot is the noisiest and it'll let that sample the area and usually it's noisier in the darker areas of the shot so I grabbed a portion up here uh, above the lattice fence where it was the darkest and that way it will degrain the shot a little better um, it's gonna be a little hard to see on YouTube when I disable this um, let's see if we crush this up a little bit might be able to see all this blockiness that's happening um, and this is with the degrain off and with the degrain on and this is in the blue channel so you can see we're just degraining it a little bit and we'll throw back on some grain later next I wanted to make sure I knew what the overall look was going to be at the end so I just went with a grade and plugged it in here and I knew I wanted kind of a bluish tint to the overall shot so I dropped down the 4 on the gain um, so that I could drop the red down to 0.9 and the green up to 0.1 and the blue up to 0.2 maybe. So if I toggle that on and off you can see it kind of just gives an overall bluish green tint to everything and sucks out a little bit of the red. And that was just to get the color and then I wanted to add um, some crushed values and I'll just copy and paste one that I have already made. Um, but if I plug this into the bottom here, all I did was uh, up the gain and adjust the black and white point and a little bit of the offset in order to get this effect. Um, typically in movies, uh, they crush the blacks a lot and raise the whites so it looks very contrasty um, to give it that film look. And that's kind of the look that I was going for. After I spent a little time on the grades, I uh, threw a little camera shake in there. Um, so that it would overall affect the effects and the footage together. That's going to go at the very end along with the rest of my grades that happened to the shot. Um, I also grained the footage 
and what I did was used a shuffle copy and shuffled the red channel out of the grade right here. It comes out to the side and gets desaturated, so that it's just black and white. I throw a grade on that to really crush up the values. I blurred it a little bit so it got rid of any denoise that was in there, and I inverted the value. I used this as a mask to plug back in to the alpha channel from the, uh, the red channel of this, because it's just RGB footage, into the alpha channel. So that when I grained, I grained in the lighter values a little differently than I grained in the darker values using that mask. And now I just package it all together in a little backdrop node and throw, throw it together where I can drag this all the way to the bottom and start working within here for the main part of my shot. So I'll show you now that this top, top portion of the shot is just the flares. So here's the original footage again where we're going to work and that's where, how we want to work on it is the original footage and not the uh, graded footage. And then I knew that I wanted to throw some flares on the top but I wanted to track them individually um, from the actual footage. So I created some flares here off to the side and they ran through an A pipe into a merge that just merges them over on top. So in order to create a tracker just hit tab TR and find it tracker and it'll create this little box and I placed it around my hand brought it in a little bit so it didn't grab any portion of the background and just did transformation I didn't do any rotation of scale because I knew I only cared about the positioning of my flare once I have that just plug it into the footage view from the tracker and hit this record button up here and it'll record forward pick your frame range and let it start. Once that's completed, go ahead and take the tracker, copy and paste it out of your script, and delete the original so that you have it outside of your initial tree. This is where you're going to plug it into your flares. So if I want, I can hit tab, grab a flare, and grab another one. Plug these into each other, plug the tracker. And if I were to create the flares on this frame, I want to make sure that I go to the Tracker Transformation tab, say Set to this frame so that it zeroes out all of the tracking information and the movement um, to this frame. That way, if you create it on this frame, you want it to look correct on this frame, and it'll go throughout the shot and match up. And then switch this transformation to Match Move. Now that you've done that, when we take uh, the flares and they go through the tracker and go on top of the merge, you can see that when I move and scrub through the timeline, that the flare stays connected to my hand. Next, let's actually throw a force field effect on top. As you can see, this is what it looked like without, and this is what it looked like with it on. This is made up of just two merges going on top. What I did was I wanted to use the original footage with a constant merged on top here to give it an overall blue tint. And I wanted to use the footage because I wanted to distort it so that it looked like the footage that was happening inside of the bubble was getting distorted. So I then threw a noise on top of that so you could see a little bit of the footage in there. And then threw an overall lens distortion and warped the entire footage so it looked a little more spherical. Once I had done that, all I did was create a roto and dragged the feather points so it gave me a little bit of an arc and it feathered in and used this as an alpha channel so that I could recut out the shape and throw it back on top of my footage. It's made up of two alphas. It's made up of an overall alpha roto which is opaque on the outside and another one, this one, that I used to mask the two out, and together they make this. Slightly darker on the inside, and this is where we're going to get the majority of our effect, and then to the outside we're going to get no effect on top. Use a shuffle copy to shuffle that alpha into this channel. So if we look at this, and then I hit A, that's the alpha channel. And it gets pre-molded with a little bit of lens distortion of the background and then that gets merged on top of the shot. The first one that I added on was a plus, which is going to brighten your shot up a little bit, 
I used this first and then covered it back up, duplicated the effect, and put it back on top with one that was less bright. Between the two, I got a little bit of brightening around the outside and the inside of the bubble, but then got the majority of the effect from the second merge. These two merges that I've thrown in here are just acting as masks that are actually plugged into a smoke element down here. The reason I have these on here is so that I could affect how the transitioning of the portal, I'm sorry, force field, would key off the screen for when I turned it off. And this way it didn't just fade off, it actually got cut out by the smoke element and gave it a little bit of a blocky turn off. Then I wanted to add a smoke element to the sides of my force field. Um, this was going to tie the effect in when it actually went off, kind of like a mini explosion, I guess. Um, so if we look down here, you can see the effect where I've turned it on and off. And I have the... This is just uh, stock smoke footage that I have reformatted and timed so that when the initial hit happens, the effect starts along the outsides here. Now comes the subtle things, but that really do matter um, and can tell the difference between professional work and not professional work. Um, I would think that a force field like this would be warping the background a little bit and warping around the edges. So I had to make sure that I added a little bit of distortion to the actual shot. This distortion is all happening through this alpha channel over here which is really just the exact same effect that we had with the noise and the lens distortion on it. Anywhere in the white is going to get distorted more than in the black areas. I shuffle that into the bottom of my tree and set the red channel to the depth. So if I view my footage at the point of this shuffle copy, where I've shuffled in this channel into the z-depth, if I come up here and select depth channel, you can see that this is my depth channel and I can go back to my RGBA and inside the eye distort I can change the UV scale which is going to be the distortion amount and make sure that the UV channels is set to the depth channel that we've created. I wanted to make sure that I distorted things to the left and the right so I made sure I had two different eye distorts one uses the values of white to shuffle things to the left whereas the other one inverts the channels that I had, reshuffles them in, and uses the exact same alpha but inverted to shuffle everything to the right. Now I didn't want to use this on the overall shot, it would have blanketed across everything, so I used the mask pullout pi pipe from the node and plug that into the actual alpha channel of my force field. The first glow in my tree is nothing special, all it's using is the mask section of this alpha channel, the same one I've been using throughout the entire shot this alpha channel and I'm just using it to go on top of the footage right there it's just making the force field a little brighter the second glow however is the one that adds the glow to the majority of my shot you can see when I turn this on I didn't want it to actually add any glow to the internal bits of the force field this is only for the outer portion of it so I use the mask right here and I use that to cut out a much more dilated out version of the mask right here and merge them together so I get this alpha channel and this is the alpha channel that I use for the second portion of the glow. This way I can affect just the outside of my force field and not the inside. And last but not least a very subtle portion of the glow but uh, definitely needed to really sell the effect and that's the third one it's actually my ground plane glow. The thing that makes this one different is it needed to circle around me, meaning I needed to row to myself and actually put myself on top of this glow. You can see that when it hits the ground it goes behind my legs and that is because of this roto. This is a roto of my legs that I went through and rotoed frame by frame. It's pretty easy, I was standing fairly still, but it does move a little bit. And I use that in the mask portion of this merge in order to cut out the roto that I used for the ground glow. So between the two you can see the holdout for my legs and then we can put the glow back on top 
and this way the glow doesn't land on top of my legs, it places me behind. If I toggle on and off the mask, you can see that it definitely sells the effect a little better. If you look at where my legs are at, it just wouldn't have looked right with this glow going over my legs. It wouldn't have placed me in the center of the force field, it would have placed me on the back end section of it. After I've completed this one frame with the look that I wanted, I just had to go through and I had to animate everything. So all the values that I was using, I just keyed them around a little bit so it gave a little bit of a flicker to the effect, and the initial in point and out point had to fade the effect on and fade the effect back off. During the fade on of the effect, I made sure that I really brightened up the lens flares, and also added more lens distortions around the back end section of the shot. You can see on this frame where I'm getting into the initial explosion when I add a bunch of lens distortion around the outside here. It's really subtle. You can only see it um, when you frame by frame, but in the actual animation, uh, there's a lot of work that gets done in these three frames that you'll probably never notice, um, but it definitely helps sell the effect. And you'll be surprised how crappy an effect like this can look, actually, before you start to put back on your color grading at the end of the shot. You can see I went from this, and really it does look pretty cheap and fake, until you put um, the actual effect back on top of all the color grading, and it really sells the effect of the two being together when it grades the footage and the effect together at the same time. Then I went through the reformat, and then I rendered it out. And that's it. It's pretty simple once it's all broken down. And uh, the way I do my effects, those techniques can be used in any program. And you can go for a completely different look using the same techniques. Now with this being the first of many videos, comment. Please comment. Um, I won't know how I'm doing unless you guys let me know. Help me to help you. Am I going a little too fast in the uh, program section or is the pacing just right? Uh, you gotta let me know. I hope this was informative and I hope we can all grow as artists together. Uh, please subscribe to the channel below and even share it with your buddies on Facebook or Twitter, anyone that you think that might be uh, interested in this kind of thing. This has been Under Phil Investigation, I'm Keith and I'm out.